Religion and Science by A. N. Whitehead. The conflict between religion and science is what naturally occurs to our minds when we think of this subject. It seems as though, during the last half century, the results of science and the beliefs of religion had come into a position of frank disagreement from which there can be no escape except by abandoning either the clear teaching of science or the clear teaching of religion. This conclusion has been urged by controversialists on either side. Not by all controversialists, of course, but by those trenchant intellects which every controversy calls out into the open. The distress of sensitive minds and the zeal for truth and the sense of importance of the issues must command our sincerest sympathy. When we consider what religion is for mankind and what science is, it is no exaggeration to say that the future course of history depends upon the decision of this generation as to the relations between them. We have here the two strongest general forces, apart from the mere impulse of the various senses, which influence men, and they seem to be set against one another. The force of our religious institutions and the force of our impulse to accurate observation and logical deduction. Since the time of Newton and Huygens in the 17th century, there have been two theories as to the physical nature of light. Newton's theory was that a beam of light consists of a stream of very minute particles, or corpuscles, and that we have the sensation of light when these corpuscles strike the retinas of our eyes. Huygens' theory was that light consists of very minute waves of trembling in an all-pervading ether, and that these waves are traveling along a beam of light. The two theories are contradictory. In the 18th century, Newton's theory was believed. In the 19th century, Huygens' theory was believed. Today there is one large group of phenomena which can be explained only by the wave theory, and another large group which can be explained only on the corpuscular theory. Scientists have to leave it at that, and wait for the future, in the hope of attaining some wider vision which reconciles both. We should apply these same principles to the questions in which there is a variance between science and religion. We would believe nothing in either sphere of thought which does not appear to us to be certified by solid reasons based upon the critical research either of ourselves or of competent authorities. But granting that we have honestly taken this precaution, a clash between the two on points of detail where they overlap should not lead us to hastily abandon doctrines for which we have solid evidence. It may be that we are more interested in one set of doctrines than in the other, but if we have any sense of perspective and of the history of thought, we shall wait and refrain from mutual anathemas. We should wait, but we should not wait passively or in despair. The clash is a sign that there are wider truths and finer perspectives within which a reconciliation of a deeper religion and a more subtle science will be found. In formal logic, a contradiction is the signal of defeat, but in the evolution of real knowledge it marks the first step in a progress towards victory. This is one great reason for the utmost toleration of variety of opinion. Once and forever, this duty of toleration has been summed up in the words, let both grow together until the harvest. The failure of Christians to act up to this precept of the highest authority is one of the curiosities of religious history. But we have not yet exhausted the discussion of the moral temper required for the pursuit of truth. There are shortcuts leading merely to an illusory success. It is easy enough to find a theory, logically harmonious and with important applications in the region of fact, provided that you are content to disregard half your evidence. Every age produces people with clear, logical intellects, and with the most praiseworthy grasp of the importance of some sphere of human existence who have elaborated or inherited a scheme of thought which exactly fits those experiences which claim their interest. Such people are apt resolutely to ignore, or to explain away, all evidences which confuse their scheme with contradictory instances. What they cannot fit in is for them nonsense. An unflinching determination to take the whole evidence into account is the only method of preservation against the fluctuating extremes of fashionable opinion. This advice seems so easy, and is in fact so difficult to follow. 
Religion is the vision of something which stands beyond, behind, and within, the passing flux of immediate things, something which is real and yet waiting to be realized, something which is a remote possibility and yet the greatest of present facts, something that gives meaning to all that passes and yet eludes comprehension, something whose possession is the final good and yet is beyond all reach, something which is the ultimate ideal and the hopeless quest. The immediate reaction of human nature to the religious vision is worship. Religion has emerged into human experience mixed with the crudest fancies of barbaric imagination. Gradually, slowly, steadily, the vision recurs in history under nobler form and with clearer expression. It is the one element in human experience which persistently shows an upward trend. It fades and then recurs. But when it renews its force, it recurs with an added richness and purity of content. The fact of the religious vision and its history of persistent expansion is our one ground for optimism. Apart from it, human life is a flash of occasional enjoyments lighting up a mass of pain and misery, a bagatelle of transient experience. The vision claims nothing but worship, and worship is a surrender to the claim of assimilation urged with the motive force of mutual love. The vision never overrules. It is always there, and it has the power of love presenting the one purpose whose fulfillment is eternal harmony. Such order as we find in nature is never force. It prevents itself as the one harmonious adjustment of complex detail. Evil is the brute motive force of fragmentary purpose disregarding the eternal vision. Evil is overruling, retarding, hurting. The power of God is the worship he inspires. That religion is strong, which in its ritual and its modes of thought evokes an apprehension of the commanding vision. The worship of God is not a rule of safety. It is an adventure of the spirit, a flight after the unattainable. The death of religion comes with the repression of the high hope of adventure.